Number 10, Grid Base Cities. Next time you find yourself at 2nd Avenue and East 59th Street in New York and get into a car accident or are just enjoying the pleasures of Manhattan traffic, you can thank the Romans. Also, shout out to New York. Chetty loves you. What's going on, New York? How you doing? How you doing? No, how you doing? Yes, it was the Romans who began to develop cities and Rome into a grid-like pattern. In a time before roads full of cars, this makes sense. I mean, come on, how much space and traffic can horses and carriages take up? There are benefits to building your city in a grid pattern. It's walkable, easy to navigate, and you can size up the city pretty well. I play a lot of city builders. I like those games, those games are fun. SimCity. Trust me, I would know. This is also true so long as your city isn't packed with skyscrapers and bumper to bumper in rideshare vehicles. You kind of lose the plot when you get to a big city like that, but they started it, there it was. Number nine, arches. For the dudes who like feet, this one is not for you. Ain't those kind of arches, dude, sorry. Today I'm talking about Roman arches. Someone somewhere in Rome discovered that the shape of an arch actually makes for a very effective uh, building. I know, who would have thought? You can tell because as soon as they were discovered, they were popping up everywhere, like pimples on prom night. Simple geometry makes complex architecture. Arches can handle their loads, even if they are overbearing. And trust me, I've seen some overbearing loads in my lifetime. Where's an arch when you need one? The arch simply is a mainstay of Roman architecture and a small part of what made up of the magnificent constructions. I'll get more to that on later. You'll see, you'll see. Number eight, sewers and sanitation. Apart from sanitation, medicine, education, wine, public order, roads, and the fresh water system, and public health, what have the Romans ever done for us? Man, I love that quote. Both historical and comical. It's kind of like, I think it's why you guys like to watch me sometimes, right? We'll try, well, we'll see. Best of both worlds, while it's true, the Romans understood how important sanitation was. While perhaps not the first invention of such, they are the inventors of the modern use of such. The Mediterranean is gorgeous, but after a diet of fish from the sea and pasta, well, you gotta go. One of the ways Romans did this was public bathrooms, except it's more like a room where you and the whole city just do what must be done in front of one another. There's no, no stalls, it's kind of just lined up. It's kind of, it's, it's a little gross, a little bit. So yes, the sanitation was a great thing, but going together all at once? Well, uh, I don't have to tell you how bad that was. Especially, you know, public washrooms, you know they can be bad. Especially with open stalls, that just can't, mm. Ah, no good. In our number seven spot today, we have Mithridate. Mithridate was named after King Mithridate VI, who was the king of Pontus. It is said that he was so terribly afraid of being poisoned that he, over the course of seven years, adapted his body to different poisons. It is also said that after mixing 54 ingredients together, he was able to create Mithridate, which is said to have been a universal antidote to all poisons. The exact formula has of course been lost to time, but historians have said that it was believed the antidote contained opium, chopped vipers, and small amounts of the poisons and their antidotes. The antidote was originally created around 100 BC and it was actually used by many people for centuries and even apparently as recently as the 19th century. It is unclear how the recipe entirely disappeared, but despite some best efforts, no one has really been able to recreate it since the last known use. In our number six spot today, we have Damascus steel. It's possible that you may have heard of Damascus steel before and that is because the name still exists and it's used in reference to a variety of pattern welded forged steel products but the modern day stuff just really isn't what it used to be. Historically Damascus steel was discovered quite a long time ago and it was used to make swords in the Middle East. It is said that these swords had the ability to cut through rocks or even completely cut through other swords which is just absolutely insane. The exact process of how these swords were made has been lost to time, but it is rumored that Wood's steel was imported from Sri Lanka and used in the creation process along with other metals. Somehow the metals were basically weaved together rather than an alloy being created. This is what led to the steel not only being exceptionally strong, but also really flexible, and it is this process that modern day smiths can't seem to exactly replicate. The modern day Damascus products are definitely high quality 
gorgeous products, but it seems as though the secrets of the past may hold something even better. In our number five spot today, we have the Telharmonium. The Telharmonium is regarded as one of the world's first electronic instruments. This instrument was kind of like an organ, but it used wheels to create different synthetic tones. From here, the tones would be transmitted over telephone wires with the intention of getting the music broadcast so that people could listen in. Considering the fact that this instrument was created in 1897, that's a pretty cool invention for the time, so the fact that it once existed really is super cool. Unfortunately, however, the idea was taking too much energy from the grid, which led to it being just totally scrapped. Instead of finding out another way to use this instrument or just waiting for technology to advance to a point where this would be able to be used, they just destroyed it. Now, in 2020, not only does the Telharmonium not exist, but there aren't even any recordings of it, so it seems as though this might be one thing that's just lost forever. In our number four spot today, we have Ulfbert. This mysterious sword has been confusing ever since it was discovered by archaeologists. Experts were able to date this sword back to the Viking era sometime from 800 to 1000 AD, but no one could figure out how this sword was made, especially with what technologies were available at the time. It seemed as though this sword was made using techniques that didn't exist until 800 years later when the Industrial Revolution happened, so how could it have been made all of that time before. It is said that everything about this sword, from the composition of the metal to the extreme heat needed to forge the blade, it just couldn't have been done at the time, but clearly it was. So how? A blacksmith who tried to recreate the sword only using methods that would have been used at the time explained that he was unable to make it without resorting to more modern technology. Number three. The Empire Business. I'm in the Empire Business. Yes, all Walter White and Saul Goodman references aside, also, good show, watch it. When one thinks of empires, the Romans just come to mind. Many have come and gone, and others have had bigger and lasted longer. However, none really had the influence and power of the mighty Roman Empire stretching all over the Mediterranean, Northern Africa, and even some parts of the Middle East. Senatus Populus Romanus. She was glorious. Unfortunately, this wouldn't last. Years of corruption in government, war, difficulty in controlling its empire from being too big, and just a lack of communication. It takes a long time to get messages around. And maybe the biggest religious reform led to, to the capital moving east and the empire being split to east and west. And then those Byzantine guys showed up and it got a little crazy. There's east and west, and then some Ottomans. It, whoa, whoa, what happened? Yeah, it didn't last forever. Sucks. Number two, concrete. There's something in that concrete, and this is related back to the arches I was talking about earlier. See, told you we get there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yep, told you. None of the gorgeous buildings Rome had ever constructed would be possible without use of their concrete. Using volcanic ash and lime mixed with a base aggregate made for a very tough and durable solid building material. You can even use this stuff underwater. Sounds like I'm giving you guys a sales pitch. It gets tougher as time goes on, and some Roman sites with buildings made of this miracle stuff have little to no wear on the material itself. That's pretty impressive. I spent countless hours awake in the late hours of the night watching dudes make Roman concrete. Am I a builder? No. Am I a tinkerer? No. Should I have been in bed? Yes. However you look at it, it's just cool stuff. There's some cool videos out there. It's really cool stuff. It like lasts forever. Like the, the buildings are actually gone, but like the concrete itself, dude, you could use it again. It's no like it's it's insane. It's just where do we go wrong? Number one, entertainment. Show business. <laughs> After bread and wine comes entertainment. Okay, no, they didn't invent fun, because Romans probably had a different idea of fun than we do. All you have to do is look at the Colosseum and some of the other large sports event centers they built. Yeah, it wasn't just the Colosseum in Rome, but across the Roman Empire, there was more. Why? Because they needed to be entertained. Gladiators, lions, fights, you know, you know what was going on. There's always been actors, storytellers, but it was the Romans who made it theatrical. If you ask any acting teacher, that's gonna tell you what counts. The theatrics. Starting off this list, in our number 10 spot, we have Greek fire. Greek fire is essentially the primitive form of napalm, and it was first created in Greece, you guessed it. It was used often and efficiently for naval battles during the Byzantine Empire. It was used and worked well for these battles because it was able to not only float on top of the water, but it also was difficult to put out the fire using water. The secrets regarding this substance were guarded so greatly because it was such a powerful weapon at the time, the information on what it was made out of, how it was stored, or how it functioned remain a mystery to this day. The formula to recreate it has been tried many times, but it is currently 
thought that the particular storage and some sort of pressurized delivery system are what played such a huge role in its functionality and ignition, and we have yet to figure out those secrets. In our number 8 spot today, we have the Antikythera Mechanism. The Antikythera Mechanism is an extremely mysterious discovery that has stumped researchers ever since it was found. This artifact was found 150 feet below the surface of the Aegean Sea in a shipwreck, and it is the oldest kind of computer ever recorded as it was dated back to the 7th century BC. The author David Childress likened the finding to if they found a jet plane in King Tut's tomb. That's how bizarre this discovery really was. Due to the complexity and oddity of the finding, alien enthusiasts have believed for quite some time that it may have been technology that was passed down from some sort of superior being. This analog computer may have had a ton of uses, and researchers aren't 100% sure about all of the ways it was used, but it is known to have been some sort of astronomical calculator. It was able to predict eclipses and different planetary placements. The mechanism was able to calculate the position and running time of each planet. How would they have been able to create this without the use of sophisticated astronomical tools? We have been able to recreate this mechanism to see how it functions, but no one is able to tell how it could have possibly been created. Number 7. Black Ink So you make papyrus paper, but what the heck are you going to use to write on it? Ink. You're going to use ink. Obviously. That's right, the ancient Egyptians actually invented ink. Now, they weren't the only ones, the Chinese also invented ink around the same time as well. But this video ain't about them. The ink used by the Egyptians was made from soot and ash from burning wood or oil mixed with water. Some of their inks even contained lead that would help ancient Egyptians bind the ink to the paper. But they didn't just use black. They had red inks made from iron based compounds as well as blue, green, white and yellow. It was a colorful place and they were likely a colorful people. Number 6. The Haircut a little off the top, Ramses. Honestly, it's time for me to get a haircut too. Is there any mommy out there willing to cut a blue eyed boy's hair? I wish. I could go for some home cooking too. Anyway, I digress. Yes, the Egyptians very well may have invented the haircut or at least regular grooming practices. Having long hair just wasn't in their culture, and honestly, in the hot sun and sands of Egypt, can you blame them? I don't think so. When I was younger, I used to have my head shaved. I thought it looked good. It kind of did, but the main reason I did it was because it kept me cool, it was functional. It may surprise you that yes, we got hot summers in Canada. So I can understand why the Egyptians did that. That being said, they did manage to keep some of their facial hair because beards are like makeup for men. We just look better with them. We look, we look good. It's a good look. Number 5. The Plow Back in the day when we started to move away from the hunter gatherer lifestyle to more of a work the land and make a new farm lifestyle, Omari would go out into the field with his hoe and cultivate his land by hand. As you can imagine, this takes a hell of a long time, but we're a problem solving species. That's why we got to where we are now. Enter the plow and the evolution of agriculture. So basically, you take your two favorite oxen and you connect them together and you connect them to a beam of wood that shoots out behind to the plow handle and to the blade of the plow that would go into the ground and be dragged behind by the ox, breaking up the ground. All the farmer has to do is sow the seed. This simple invention changed everything and it's still used in places where machinery is just unaffordable. Number 4. The Calendar No one would blame you if in the last two years you forgot what day it was. I know after spending a lot of time inside, I forgot what day it was, but every day is a Saturday when you eat spicy chicken wings in your tidy whities. Well, the Egyptians may have had one of the first calendars and a gosh darn good one too. Their calendar had 12 months and over 300 days. The trouble is after a while it kind of got a little inaccurate. They did their best to fix it. I mean clearly if you look at the calendar, I mean clearly it's the, it's the fifth of, uh, well I think that looks like three men walking in sand. And next month we have a special festival happening. It looks like it'll be a sunny day on the 12th of uh, man with ball on, on his hat. H hieroglyphs are hard man, I don't know. Number 3. Earthquake Detector Earthquakes are a big problem. It's an issue in California as they're still waiting for the big one. It's a problem in Pokemon. When the gym leader I thought was going to be easy surprised me with an earthquake and like one shots my team. And it was a problem in ancient China. I've already experienced one before myself in real life, and if I had to describe to anyone what it felt like, it felt like the ground was a waterbed. Some of you are probably not going to know what a waterbed is, but 
that's what it felt like. Well, it was so much of an issue that Zhang Hang made the groundbreaking invention of a seismometer, a device that can detect ground movement. It can't predict them, but it can tell you where they're coming from, using vibrations and tiny balls that would fall into frog-shaped cups depending on which direction it was coming from, something that goes hand in hand with the compass from earlier. Oh, interesting. Number two, beer. First tea, now beer? Oh, wait, no, first beer. The earliest recorded consumption of beer was in China 9,000 years ago. I could kiss these people. Two of my favorite beverages. That's it, I'm moving back in time to ancient China. Only, this beer wasn't exactly the same as the kind of beer we would think of made of barley. They used rice, hawthorn, honey, and grapes to make their beer. This 4 or 5% alcohol was mentioned in inscriptions from the Shang Dynasty, so that would be 1600 BC to 1046 BC. But pottery from around 7000 BC contains traces of this same kind of alcohol. That's before even the Egyptian pharaohs. And three and a half to 4,000 years before the Sumerians created the Western modern day interpretation of beer. The liquid was known as Zhu in Chinese and is often used as a spiritual offering to the heavens and the earth or to ancestors. And you know what? It still is, baby. Number one, paper money. The Zhaozi currency was the first time in history we used paper money. The stacks, the wad, the dough, the shkarol, the Benjamins, the Bordens, dead presidents, and the bread. There's no greater feeling than walking into a mall with a wad of cash, is there? JC Penny, here I come. Well, we have ancient China to thank for that. Well, sort of. Coins and metal were still more common and used for hundreds of more years before we started printing. In reality, the paper makes more sense. Before printing, coins could have been manipulated into making doubles or counterfeit. There wasn't a press yet, but with paper, it could be issued certain identifiers and used for certain things. The problem with the Jiaozi money is that it wasn't backed by anything, so it did cause a little bit of uh, what my generation knows too much, inflation. Number 10, bowling. Where would we be as a species if we didn't spend the entirety of the 1990s in bowling alleys and arcades? In later years, they seem to have fallen out of style, and for the life of me, I can't figure out why. Where else for $20 a person can you spend time in a large building with the heat on and the youngest people besides you and your friends is a league of retiree bowlers saying questionable things in the lane beside you. A blue carpet with planets and rocket ships has the same amount of character as the musky clown shoes you wear as you approach the snack stand. A waff of radioactive nacho cheese assaults your nose as the bubblegum chewing student behind the counter asks if you want another room temperature domestic beer. <laughs> nice. The foam and bacteria forming in your stomach is a classic tale of a bowling alley tucked away in a Midwest snow-covered state. <laughs> nice. Now, with my colorful depiction aside, let's get to the history. None of that glory would be possible without the Egyptians. Yes, they invented bowling. No nacho cheese and weird animations on the TV, but it was still bowling. The ball was made of rope and leather, or sometimes rock, as were the pins. Throw it at the pins. Simple. That's it. That's bowling. <laughs> Number nine, math. Oh, math. You remind me of a simpler time. A time when I was bawling my eyes out while my dad asked me over and over again, what is nine times three? Expecting me to come up with the answer under the enormous weight of patriarchal pressure. 27, dad, it's 27. While the ancient Greeks usually get credit for coming up with mathematics, they actually took it from the Egyptians across the Mediterranean. And then yes, they improved upon it. The Egyptians used a numeral system that helped them solve equations involving multiplication and the absolutely disgusting fractions. These guys understood concepts such as geometry and algebra, and they were the first civilization to develop and solve second degree quadratic equations. I don't even know what that means. I wonder if there was ever a little ancient Egyptian boy who got yelled at at the ancient dinner table by his ancient father about finding the circumference of a circle in the middle of the night. Probably. Number eight, papyrus. I heard Egyptians like paper. Well, you're gonna be doing a lot of paper rolling when you're living in a van down by the river. Huh, strange. I, I think I've heard that somewhere before. Yes, the Egyptians gave the world papyrus, which eventually would become paper. Writing stuff down before this was very difficult. It was inscribed in clay or stone tablets. That's hard. How is a stenographer supposed to do their job? Or when you get mad at an office printer for not working? You can't just break the tablet. We've all been there before, and if I were to make a list of the most important inventions of all time, paper would be on that list. Number seven, gunpowder. 
Okay, sure, we all know what gunpowder is and what it does. After all, what's a soldier without his blam blam? A cowboy without his big iron, or a pirate ship without cannons? I'd argue those things are nothing without that. However, I'd like to think of a more peaceful use, and not just because YouTube sweats when I bring up pistols. I remember a long time ago where my father would get a bucket from the Shmome Depot. He'd fill it up with sand, and we'd walk to a secluded part of the suburban area and launch fireworks. Sometimes we'd launch them into the streets, but that depended on how much rye he had. Depends. At least there was a bucket. Safety first, right? Well, none of that would have been possible without the invention from China. Gunpowder was invented by Chinese alchemists in the 9th century. Originally, it was made by mixing elemental sulfur, charcoal, and saltpeter, potassium nitrate. The charcoal traditionally came from the willow tree, but grapevine, hazel, elder laurel, and pine cones have all been used in the process. Number 6. Deep Drilling the province of Sichuan in ancient China, yes, like the sauce, was landlocked and about 1,200 miles from the sea. Because of that, they ain't got no sea salt. So, in order to get salt, the ancient Chinese from around the 2nd century BC developed drilling technology to get brine from deep in the earth, which naturally forms from evaporation of ground saline water. Look at that. We're all learning today. Salt is obviously quite an important resource, but the boring and drilling technology only got better and better, resulting in more and more resources to be found, like natural gas, <laughs> which could be used as fuel. And in the 11th century, the Chinese had the technology to be able to drill those suckers up to 3,000 feet deep, which is pretty deep in case you did not know. Number 5. Silk I, for one, was always too broke to afford silk, especially after fireworks. Those bad boys are super expensive. Silk was an important thing in ancient China for the main reason that they invented the process of harvesting silk and were keeping it an ancient Chinese secret. Now, when you have a stockpile of a very valuable raw material that nobody else can get their hands on, and you have a stockpile of the finished product of which is a quality of clothing no one else can match, well, you're going to be quite wealthy. Well, I don't need to pitch this in the Shark Tank. It's time to start selling and trading, and that's just what China did. This was a very profitable trade, so it got its own road. Or roads, the Silk Road wasn't just, just one. The people who were buying from China loved it so much they wanted their own instead of paying exuberant prices. But it took them a long time to figure out what the process actually was. They thought it grew on trees. It comes from Number four, acupuncture. Have you ever had acupuncture done? Have you ever had acupuncture done? I've not. Neither have I. Let us know in the comments. I want to know if it actually works. When I was looking up this topic, it was called pseudoscience and said that there was no actual scientific proof that it works. Whether it does or doesn't, the practice of acupuncture is ancient. We know this from a less ancient book called the Neijing that was written around 305 BC to 204 BC and was the earliest book of Chinese medicine we know of. It was also called the classic of internal medicine of the Yellow Emperor. Who was the Yellow Emperor? Well, that would be Huang Di, whose period lasted from 2697 to 2597 BC. And this guy, this emperor, revolutionized the practice of acupuncture. So all of that was a very long, long-winded way of saying that acupuncture as a practice has been around for more than 4,722 years. Look, writing videos is hard, okay? Just give me a break. Number three, clocks. All right, so I'm not going to sit here and tell you the Egyptians invented the modern clock. No, but they did have to tell time. And as any dad or survival guru will tell you, the most reliable way to tell what time of the day it is would be that massive floating ball of plasma in the sky, the sun, assuming it isn't a super cloudy day or anything. The obelisks we see in Egypt were not just fancy deco pieces. They were actually sun clocks, used to see how the sun would cast shadows throughout different times of the day. They even used it to figure out which days were longer and shorter. There was an even more interesting clock though, a water clock. It was basically a stone vessel with a tiny little hole at the bottom which allowed water to drip at a constant rate. The water marks spaced out at different levels would tell you how many hours had passed. This one's good because it worked at night and on cloudy days as well. Number two, mummification. Welcome back to the land of the living, my friend. You've been gone for quite some time. <laughs> oh. Yes, the process of mummification, probably the number one thing ancient Egypt is known for, maybe besides the pyramids. While not the only civilization of the past to practice this, they kind of ran the show here. Basically, the pharaoh's corpse has to stay fresh so their soul can make it into the afterlife. 
The heart stays, but everything else is like a furniture after a bad divorce. It must go. The brain was stirred up like a family reunion square dance and drained like last night's punch bowl. But wait, horror fans, there's more. Lungs, liver, bladder, intestines, stomach, kidney, and basically anything you can scoop out with your favorite ice cream scoop is going. But don't toss them out, though. Some of these organs were preserved in jars. Makes nice decorations beside the piles of gold found in the tombs. Yes, my liver jars. Oh, his. Number one, cosmetic makeup. The ancient Egyptians created makeup as far back as 4000 BC. That's a long time ago. And that's how long we've been obsessed with our looks. Yikes. Their makeup actually served more of a purpose than just looking good though. The eye makeup they used specifically was believed to cure eye diseases, which wasn't true, and would protect them from the evil eye, which, I don't know, could have been true. Kind of like the ink, they would use soot, but they would combine it with a lead mineral called galena to create a black substance they called coal. That's K-H-O-L, not C-O-A-L. They had multiple colors actually. They would make green makeup by combining malachite with galena. Now, if you saw our bizarre beauty products and history video, you probably know that lead, even lead minerals like galena, aren't really great for you. But hey, anything in the name of looking good. Number 10, tea. I honestly don't think I could make it through the day without a cup of tea in the morning. The Brit in me just can't do it. But I owe this to China. Specifically, I owe this to Chinese Emperor Shenong from way back in 2737 BC. Now listen to this story. Once upon a time, Emperor Shenong liked to drink hot water. One day, while out on a march with his army, they stopped to rest and catch their breath. At the camp, a servant was preparing Shenong's hot water when a leaf from a tree fell and landed in the water, turning it brown. Instead of discarding the new liquid, it was presented to the emperor, who drank and found it refreshing. Boom! Tea. While used as medicine before this, in the Tang Dynasty, it really became a common beverage enjoyed by many. This time period from 616 to 908 AD also saw the Book of Tea, written by Lu Yu, which contained ways to cultivate tea, tea drinking, and different classifications of tea in details. Thanks, Lu Yu. You the best. Number nine, compass. A vast sea all drunken sailors and maybe Jack Sparrow, depending on how long the trial lasts. We'll see how it goes. The invention of the compass hails from the ancient land to the east. I learned again today. Who would have thought? Who would have thought? Not me. Way back in the Han Dynasty, the first use of the compass was accomplished with a lodestone. For those who forgot what that was from their grade 4 museum field trip, tisk tisk, it will be on the test later, as well as some vocabulary in English. A lodestone is a naturally occurring magnet and aligns itself with the magnetic field, brother. While only used for land at first, it wasn't long before it made its way onto a boat, where it speculated it was traded off into the Islamic world and eventually the west. My only experience with the compass was in Minecraft, and it doesn't point north, it points to spawn. Boy, did I learn the hard way. Number eight, movable type printing. Fun fact, the first book with a verifiable date of printing appeared in China in the year 868, or nearly 600 years before that happened in Europe. While the printing press would come much later in Europe, the idea of being able to print identical copies without handwriting began 2,000 years ago in the Western Han Dynasty. You see, before this point, if you wanted to pass on the good word of your religion, or teach somebody something, or tell somebody about the past, or give secret little I love you notes to each other, you had to either do it by word of mouth or handwriting. <coughs> Gross. Then, in the previously mentioned Han Dynasty, people began stone tablet rubbing, which evolved into carving words and pictures onto a stone board, lathering that bad boy up with ink and pressing it onto paper. And boom, that's printing. But then, in 1041 to 1048, a guy named Bai Sheng carved characters on identical pieces of clay which he hardened by baking, resulting in pieces of movable type that could be stored and used again later. And now we have printers. Innovation, am I right? Number seven, roads. All roads lead to Rome. This might sound very stupid, but to us, the Roman roads did change history. Given that there's still Roman roads out there right now that have survived 2,000 years of climate and use, it's pretty impressive. And then there's our modern roads that give in after a couple bad winters in your grandfather's boat of a Buick creating potholes every time he breaks. 
The road is considered of layers of rock and dirt that made for a sturdy road. Hundreds of civilians, horses, traders, carts traveling back and forth on Roman roads every day. Imagine how hard it would be to get to the next city over with no car and no road. That's some rough traveling. Too bad we couldn't have them back or build our roads today. I've got some denarius for the next Roman to build me a road, baby. Come on, come on over, build us a road. Number six, aqueducts. These are honestly amazing feats of engineering. Even today, it's, it's, it's a lot of bricks to lay down for a little bit of water. So the question is, you build a very busy city, probably the most impressive city and cities of the ancient era. You need two things for all those folks, water and food. Okay, well, we can do farms outside the city walls, no problem, but Water, we need people to drink water and those, those farms need water too. How do you get water to a busy city center? Aqueducts, basically a long bridge that connects freshwater springs to the fountains of the city, essentially running water. This for the time was very incredible. Hundreds if not thousands of years ahead of their time. To be able to walk into town and drink fresh water was a luxury, one that Rome might have taken for granted. Now every home has running water, and it's great and we all love it. You love tap water, I love tap water. Where's my Brita? Number five, Roman numerals. Attack of the math. Look, I don't wanna give the Romans too much credit, but Gosh darn, I guess they did a lot. Sure, we don't use their numbers in regular life today, but they still appear in places once in a while. Uh, like the Star Wars movies, they use them. Uh, they have titles and, and names, and, and, and sometimes just to confuse students when trying to tell time. Sometimes the clocks have Roman numerals on them for some reason. For once, that was something actually I didn't struggle with in school. Who would have thought? The Roman numeral system is based on certain letters representing ones and tens until it gets into larger denominations and more letters get, get thrown in. Basically, anything from 1 to 1,000, you're good. You're doing great. After that, eh, you're going to need some more papyrus. I had enough trouble with algebra and adding some letters to my numbers in math class, but now my numbers are actually just letters? Whoa, I don't think, uh, I don't think so, cowboy. Uh, <laughs> I didn't sign up for that. Nope. I'll be in drama class. Much easier. I'm not going to math class. I'm going to drama class. Nope. Number four, the Julian calendar. Imagine being such a mighty and powerful leader that you get a calendar named after you. Yes, the Julian calendar is named after Julius Caesar, the man, the myth, the legend. You might be thinking to yourself, well, we don't use that calendar today, do we? Well, as it turns out, we do. Most of the world goes by the Gregorian calendar from Pope Gregory, which was a revision of the Julian calendar. Yeah, I know. I was surprised too. I didn't know that. Wait till you hear where the months of August and July come from. Your boy Augustus and yet again Julius Caesar. Yes, the dude made a whole month for himself and just threw it in there. Okay, now hear me out. We're gonna break. We're gonna break some stuff down here. Ready? Octa, Nova, and Deca are all prefixes for eight, nine, and ten. Right? Just like October, November, and December are the eighth, ninth, and tenth months out of the year. Well, that makes sense. Big prank, though. Ah, uh, I got gotcha. you. Nice try. Because after July and August were added, the others got pushed back. But it's crazy what you can do with a little power. It's crazy. So now October, November, December are 10, 11, and 12. They got pushed back. See, it's crazy. You ever wonder that? See, that's how they did it. It makes. I just. I, there's some people like. I actually didn't know that. I open up your mind, brother. That's what I do. That's what I do here. In our number two spot today, we have Stradivari violins. If you're a string instrument enthusiast, then you definitely have heard of the Stradivari family and the instruments created by them. These instruments were created between 1650 and 1750, and they were highly sought after in their day, and even more so now. Apparently, these instruments feature an unparalleled sound quality that has been found to be impossible to recreate. The instruments that have survived through to the modern day are now worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. So it is abundantly clear that these instruments are incredibly valuable. Here's the catch though. Experts can't agree or figure out what exactly it is that makes them sound so wonderful. Some have speculated that the magnificent sound comes from a fungus that grew in the region. Some think that it's the density of the wood, but regardless, no one really knows for sure. At the end of the day, the secrets of the family art were laid to rest with the Stradivari family. In our number one spot today, we have the Library of Alexandria. This isn't necessarily technology as 
as we now think of the word, but this certainly was one of the greatest losses we've seen. This library is said to have held a collection of over one million scrolls, which are said to have been all the written works in the world at the time. The library was founded in 300 BC, and it was where the scholars of the time would come to study. When a person visited the library, they needed to give over any books that they had so that they could be copied and added to the collection of the library. It isn't exactly clear what it was that destroyed the library, but rumors range from Julius Caesar accidentally setting it on fire to an invasion that set it ablaze. At the end of the day, the building burned and everything in it was destroyed. What was in that building was absolutely priceless, and we can only guess at what kind of secrets it held. Unfortunately, many of what was in the library wasn't written anywhere else, so it's destined to stay a mystery. Yeah.